there are huge changes happening right now in the short-term rental market. Austin, Phoenix, Boise, Idaho, those were the hot spots for short-term rental investors back in 2020. And it seemed like you couldn't go 10 feet without hearing the term Airbnb or short-term rental. A lot of people bought short-term rentals thinking it was the easy path to money. Flash forward a few years and things are much different. And this information I'm going to share today is crazy. So check it out. We're all about Airbnb short-term rentals on today's video. Before I get started, do me a favor and like this video. If you get any value, you may consider subscribing to my channel too, but you don't have to. All right, check this out. The article I'm using today is by a company called Resi Club Analytics. And Resi Club's a fantastic data analytic company for real estate. The link's in my description below. And they have an article they posted called Air DNA, these are the 25 best places to invest in short-term rentals in 2024. And I'm curious, comment below, do you see a lot of short-term rentals in your neighborhood? And what do you think of short-term rentals? Do you think they're good for the United States or are they the absolute demise? And if you invest in short-term rentals, I'd like to hear from you too, because I invest in short-term rentals. Don't kill me. And I'd like to know, are you profitable? Were you profitable in 2023? Is 2024 shaping up to be a good year or are you getting your rear end handed to you? All right, let's get to the article. AirDNA is a website that basically like Zillow for short-term rental investors. You may want to check them out. I'm not going to the site now. I'm using Lance's article from Resi Club Analytics to look at what's happening. And he comments on the article they put out. The subheading of this article is, who is missing from AirDNA's list of best places to invest in short-term rentals? is telling. So early in the pandemic and over the next couple of years, areas like Austin and in Tennessee, even in areas out like Boise, Idaho, those were hot spots for short-term investors. People thought it was really hip and cool to buy them and you know get to go in and decorate them and they were going to make piles of cash. However, again, things have shifted a lot. And that's what we're going to look at in this article. So I'll read some of this article now. The pandemic created a perfect storm for the short-term rental market. Demand skyrocketed as stimulus-fueled professionals who could work from anywhere booked short-term rental stays amid the shutdown of international travel and cruises. With limited alternatives available, daily rates spiked. And on top of that, quarantine easing induced historically low mortgage rates and you ignite an Airbnb buying frenzy that reached bonanza levels in markets like Phoenix and Austin. And if you live in one of those markets, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Tons of short-term rentals popped up. And a lot of these metros are banning short-term rentals now because they just don't want them in the neighborhoods. But it was short-lived as lockdowns lifted and travel options expanded with the return of cruises and international travel, coupled with an influx of new short-term rental properties bought during the frenzy, the market dynamic shifted. Many hosts have witnessed a decline in occupancy rates and a corresponding fall in daily rates. So speaking from personal experience, when you invest in an Airbnb property or a short-term rental property, it's different than a long-term rental property, mainly because you're concerned about the daily rate, not necessarily the a monthly rate. And there are also a lot of costs involved that you don't have with long-term rentals. So what they're pointing at here is, hey, during the pandemic, people got all excited about short-term rentals. And a lot of people decided I'm going to buy them as my investment. I'm going to make a fortune. And it looks like, according to this article, those rates, the daily rates that people are getting for short-term rentals, they're dropping in many areas. And you're not getting what you used to because supply has spiked. And keep this in mind when you think about the housing market in the United States, because the housing market has low supply right now and prices have remained sticky or actually increasing. And so supply and demand is really what it's about, folks. And that's what Airbnb is experiencing now in short-term market rentals are experiencing. You have more supply than demand and prices are dropping. And the article actually points to someone who invested in Joshua Tree, California. So this says, oversaturated short-term rental markets like Joshua Tree, a desert community that was a vacation hotspot during the pandemic, have plunged into short-term rental corrections or Airbnb bust. Look no further 
then 60815 Alta Loma Drive in Joshua Tree, California. The one-bedroom mid-century modern home was purchased in $600,000 amid the frenzy in September of 2021 as mortgage rates spiked. Joshua Tree's short-term rental-driven boom turned to bust. In December of 23, just a couple months ago, the home was resold for just $340,000. Crazy. 600 grand to 340 grand. That's a massive loss. So I actually brought up this address uh, in Joshua Tree on my screen. And this software I'm using is called PropStream. There, it, this is a paid subscription that I'm using. I pay like $100 a month, I think, for this. But I use it for real estate investing all the time. And it provides insight that Zillow and a lot of other sites don't provide. It even sometimes has better information than my local MLS. So anyway, looking at this address right now, and yeah, estimated value right now is $397,000. Last year, $647,000. Just crazy. Now, it doesn't have a great picture of the property. It's like just in the middle of the desert. If you look at this, I mean, I don't know. I know I've been to Joshua Tree a, a few times and it's a great spot, but I don't know about 600 grand. Obviously, people didn't think so either. Huh. So that's just unbelievable, right? Somebody actually lost a couple hundred thousand dollars on the property. Just nuts. Let's go back to the article. Amid this backdrop where saturation and local law changes have pushed down some short-term rental markets into correction mode, AirDNA rolled out its annual list of best places to invest in short-term rentals in 2024. And they note here, Resi Club's sharing of this list shouldn't be seen as an endorsement. Please do your own research. And I agree. I think the article is interesting that Air DNA put out and that Lance is covering in the Resi Club article, but don't take the Air DNA data as gospel. I just thought it was interesting as to where the market is shifting. So this list has the top 25 areas to invest in Airbnbs or short term rentals, according to Air DNA. There are several areas that are not listed, like Austin, Boise, and Phoenix. In fact, there's not a single Texas, Arizona, or Idaho market on the list. That's telling. And it is telling. So one of the things you've just heard in the article, and if you live in an area that has a ton of Airbnbs, um, saturating you know neighborhoods, you'll know this to be true. A lot of metros are banning Airbnbs and short-term rentals like Dallas, I think Las Vegas is doing it, and so is New York City. And I'm sure there's other metros too that are doing it. So one of the things I would say immediately is uh, if you want to get involved in short-term rentals and investing is check the local regulations because they can change. I know people that have purchased Airbnbs or short-term rentals and ended up having to sell them because the local laws changed and they weren't allowed to have short-term rentals anymore. And there's a lot of people that try to skirt the regulations and the laws and they go, well, I'll just put a a casita out in the back of my property and not have an address. And then people can come and rent it, even though I'm not allowed to have a short-term rental. Don't do that. There's no, it's just nuts to invest in real estate. If you're not going to be upfront and honest about it, it doesn't make any sense. Air DNA has came out with the list of the best places to invest in short-term rentals in 24. And here's the list. And it's shocking. All right, ready? First one, Columbus, Georgia. Who knew, right? And the way they get this ranking is they look at not only affordability to purchase a short-term rental, how much it is, the occupancy rate. They also look at the daily short-term rental rate. So what's what's the average rate that people get daily and the average uh, revenue, the annual revenue. So according to this uh, chart, Columbus, Georgia has a 60% occupancy. Typical home value is $160,000. That's cheap. Even for me in Ohio, that's cheap. Um, the average daily rate, $178 and annual revenue, average annual revenue, $29,000. Take that data with a grain of salt and make sure you do your own research down to the actual street uh, if you want to look at uh, short-term rentals and investing in them. So then it has Air DNA rental demand score and it has 74 on here, I guess out of 100. So that's, I guess you add those data points together and, they're, and Columbus, Georgia is ranked number one. Number two is Ellisworth, Maine. I don't know. I don't know anything about that city. Maine's a beautiful state, so maybe that, that uh, makes sense. $324,000 home value, 73% occupancy, $335 average night, $41,000 in annual revenue, 
and a 99 out of 100 score on demand. Wow. So I guess this area in Maine is like really, it's it's in high demand, I guess, for short-term rentals. Number three is unbelievable. In the United States, the third best city, according to Air DNA, to invest in for short-term rentals in 2024 is none other than Logan, Ohio. I'm going to show you where Logan, Ohio is. I'm going to show you where this is located. Now, here's Columbus. You can see Columbus, Ohio. That's where, um, that's the capital and where Ohio State is, the Ohio State Buckeyes. <laughs> but if you look, um, there's an area south east of Columbus called Hawking Hills. And Hawking Hills has a lot of, um, a ton of, a ton to do outside. They have a, a, a famous cave, or at least it's famous in Ohio called old man's cave. Uh, they have tons to do as far as like zip lining. It's, it's a pretty big tourist area of Ohio. If there even is a tourist area of Ohio, that would be it. So a lot of people like Hawking Hills and Logan is a city in Hawking Hills. And I bring this up because I do live in Ohio. This is about an hour and a half for me where this is located. And it just shocked me that that is the third best market to invest in for short-term rentals. I know people that have short-term rentals down there, they do well, but I have seen a lot listed for sale online lately too. So while AirDNA says, hey, this is a great place to invest, again, make sure you do your research. I'm not convinced right now I would buy in Logan unless I knew exactly what I was getting involved in from a short-term rental standpoint, because as more people recognize that Logan is a great place to invest, more people are going to put their money there, becomes more saturated and more competitive and your rates and your revenue can drop. So if you invest in Logan for some reason, I'd love to know, tell me, is it going well or is it going bad? So yeah, that's where Logan is. And it's saying the typical home value, $233,000. 57% occupancy. This is important to look at that stat of 57% uh, occupancy. Notice it's not 100%. I've actually talked to people, this is unbelievable, but I've talked to people, investors that will say, hey, I looked at the short-term rental rates in that area where I want to invest and it's like $99 a night. So times $365, that's a lot of money. Wrong you don't just assume you're going to rent it every night. That's not practical. In fact, they're saying third best area to invest only has a 57% occupancy. So half the time, you're not even getting this thing filled. Now they say the demand score for Logan is 68 out of 100. So that's not too shabby, but it's definitely not 99. All right, let's look down the list here. There's some other ones that are kind of interesting. Akron, Ohio. That stands out too. Now I'm not going to show you Akron on a map, but I would never expect in a million years that Akron would be picked and on this list. I mean, who's going to Akron for tourist attractions? Maybe they are. I, I don't know. Um, maybe I have to go check out Akron, Ohio. I mean, I've been there a lot, but I've never seen any, you know, I didn't know that people are, are flocking there for a short-term rental. What's amazing is a lot of the cities that are on this list now are not tourist type areas that you would traditionally think of. So like Gatlinburg or, um, you know, there's some other areas like, uh, uh, Boise and Austin uh, that traditionally were on the short-term rental hip list and they're completely off that list now. And it looks like areas like Akron, Ohio have replaced areas like Austin. Crazy. And the fact that they're just kind of normal areas in the United States, you know, Logan, Ohio isn't, you know, it's not the, uh, you know, it's, it's not the Riviera by any means. Um, and Akron isn't the Riviera either. And so these new places that are popping up could be good for short-term investors. They may not be good for the residents there who don't want them, but they could be good for investors if you happen to invest in one of these, you know, obscure areas. And I'll talk about why in a minute. I mean, look at some of the, like a couple of these, I know, you know, very well, right? Um, you go to Fairbanks, Alaska, not bad. Um, then go down Anaheim, California, maybe because of Disneyland, I assume. Again, Disneyland, for Anaheim, but then go up and what's in uh, Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina? I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you're from that area. Winter Haven, Florida. I've heard about that several times and I haven't been there myself, but seems like a good, good place. But then you've got Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay. And now Anaheim. All right. North Myrtle Beach. That makes sense. Myrtle Beach as a short-term investment and short-term rental area. 
Okay, I buy that. North Las Vegas, sure. Cocoa Beach, Florida, that makes sense. And then you've got Ashford, Washington. I mean, their demand score is 94. So a lot going on there, obviously. Again, I go back to Akron, Ohio. Maybe it's because I'm from Ohio. It just stands out, but 66 demand. I mean, the houses are cheap, $145,000. I guess a lot of people are visiting Akron. If you're from Akron, if you happen to watch my channel, please leave a comment. I'd love to know what's going on in Akron, Ohio. All right, article continues. AirDNA acknowledged that last year's backdrop for the short-term rental market was tough. However, they're more optimistic. No kidding. That's all they do is short-term rentals. 2024 will likely be a breath of fresh air for short-term rental hosts and investors discouraged by the tough year 2023 turned out to be. As we predicted, revenue per available room died down in 2023 following the heights of 2021 and 22. The year closed out with an average drop of 6.7% according to AirDNA's latest outlook. Though declines should ease and the revenue should grow slightly in 2024. This gives Airbnb hopefuls reason to consider entering or re-entering the best short-term rental markets. Okay, this next part, again, regulation plays a big part in the Airbnb and short-term rental market. As a part of this research for the 2024 list, AirDNA looked at local regulation. We consider both current regulatory risks for STR investors and the potential for future regulations in our assessment of top short-term rental locations. Our perspective is focused on real estate investors, so we classify municipalities that limit STRs to either hosted stays, where the property owner is present during the guest stay, or primary residences as highly restrictive. We highlight markets with significant regulations in the market write-ups for that location, wrote AirDNA. So the article goes on to say that Airbnb had a great uh, earnings, better expected earnings on Tuesday. Um, and they're looking for, uh, you know, as rates, interest rates come down, that investors will pile back into short-term rentals. The problem is that regulation, and you can tell by this art, by this article and this uh, paragraph here that they are looking heavily at where short-term rentals are regulated. Because if they're regulated and they're not allowed, they're not going to grow there, obviously, right? Now that we've looked at the shift from the hip areas like Austin to the strange areas like Akron, Ohio, I'm just going to share for a second what I've done to be successful with short-term rentals. A lot of people, when they look at short-term rentals, they look at the you know, the allure and the romance of it. They think if they can go out and buy a cool house in a cool area, use it when they want to, kind of like a timeshare, and then rent it out and money will just fly in from, from above. However, I took a different route. I don't like the hip areas. I don't spend my money in those areas and I don't invest in those areas. I like to pick areas that actually need affordable housing and then I look to service those areas with affordable housing. Now, I own several Airbnb or short-term rentals. None of them are single family houses though. They're all in apartment buildings. And I cater to mainly traveling nurses and traveling professionals. Many short-term rental investors use websites like VRBO and Airbnb to advertise their properties. And again, a lot of people like the romance of short-term rentals, but I like to think of it in a more utilitarian type approach. So the website I use again is furnishfinder.com. I actually have my units listed on Airbnb as well, although all my leads and most of my tenants come from Furnish Finder and I prefer to use furnishfinder.com. Furnish Finder is a website that sources furnished apartments and it's mainly geared to traveling professionals and nurses. And so it's not really geared to vacationers. I haven't received any people just vacationing um, who comes and come and stay at my places. And the other thing I do, and this is important, this is important for tax reasons. And it's also important for the quality of tenant. I usually require at least a month's stay. And that's important. And honestly, most of the time, my tenants are three months stays or more, sometimes six months, but rarely Will I accept somebody if it's just a month or less? And I do that because I want more consistency in my units. So I'm not someone who actually hosts uh, one person one day 
and then someone else the next day, and then the next day, and the next day. What I do is I book these uh, tenants for at least 30 days, usually three months at a time. And that's why I like Furnish Finder. They uh, gear themselves and they kind of cater to someone like a traveling nurse who's on assignment for three months at a time. You can see the pictures on the screen. I mean, this unit is newly renovated. I put a lot of money into it. It's clean. It functions. It's in a safe area. However, it's not the Taj Mahal and I'm not charging top of the line rent. What I've noticed from a lot of other Airbnb investors is that they look at the daily rate only. And if you look at how much expense you have using a daily tenant, it is astronomical. Meaning if you're an investor and you own one of these units and every day you have someone different come in or every other day or every four days, you're constantly paying for a company to turn that unit around because that's a huge cost to doing business. And a lot of hosts, a lot of investors forget that or don't think about, hey, who am I going to have turn this place around? Unfortunately, many people think, oh, I'll do that myself. Well, if you happen to be sick or you're on vacation or your kid has a function or life gets in the way and you have a tenant that's moving in tomorrow, you've got to stop what you're doing, go out there, clean the place and get it all set up for the next tenant. Forget that business. This website and renting to short-term tenants on a 30-day minimum stay, at least for me, has worked pretty well. You can see the pictures now on the screen. Um, again, it's not like the Taj Mahal by any means. It has great features. Uh, it's, it, it, it's been renovated, but it's affordable. So right now I'm charging $985 a month for this unit. That's what I'm charging. And again, it's a one month stay minimum, but a lot of people stay three months. And here's the other thing about Furnish Finder. It actually gives you the ability as part of the process to screen the tenant with a background check and a criminal uh, history check, a credit check, uh, so that you know what type of tenant you're getting. With Airbnb, they just give a credit card and it's almost like guaranteed that they can stay there. So for me, Furnish Finder is the way to go. Anyway, if you want to get into real estate investing with short-term rentals, I highly encourage you to check this out. Check out this website because when I found this service and got clued into another side of short-term rentals, it really opened my eyes. And this has been fantastic for my business. I don't think I've been empty really more than a week in the last two years. And I'm already booked through like the middle of the year of 2024. And I'm looking to buy more of these buildings to do the same thing. And something else to look at is the area that you're investing in. So they say location matters and location is everything, right? This property is in a city called Mount Vernon, Ohio, which is a tiny town. I think there's like 50,000 people that live there. But what they do have is a hospital. They have like most towns, a hospital, and they need traveling nurses to come help them at that hospital. So because of that, those nurses need a safe, clean, good place to live. And oftentimes hotels are too expensive and they don't want to live in a hotel for three months and renting a whole house for each month isn't feasible. Most landlords aren't going to do a three month lease. So that's where I pick a lot of my business up from because the people, the other investors that have units in Mount Vernon charge by the day on Airbnb and they're charging $80, $100, 150 a day. Well, times 30 days for a month is outrageous. That's not what I do. I do a month minimum for $985, much more affordable. Put some money in my pocket and help somebody when they need a place to live. And here's the last thing about short-term rentals. You have to make sure it will cash flow as a long-term rental. What do I mean by that? If you're focusing only on short-term rentals and that's how you're going to make your money and you're banking on the short-term rental working, what happens if they change regulations and no longer can you have your short-term rental? Uh-oh, you then can't convert it to a long-term rental if it doesn't cash flow as a long-term rental. You may have to sell the building. You don't want to do that. So make sure what you're buying will cash flow as a long-term rental, meaning every month a tenant pays you rent. So instead, you know, if they change the regulations locally, you can just pivot, put it on the market as a long-term rental, maybe furnish long-term rental or sell the furniture and put a tenant in there for a year at a time or six months or whatever you decide to do. So this building and my other short-term rentals, cash flow is long-term rentals 
And so if regulations change, I can just turn it into a long-term rental, put a tenant in there and keep going. So the last thing I'll show you is a feature on Furnish Finder that actually can give you kind of a demand score, if you will, of the area. Remember, AirDNA has a score of demand they come up with in their own specialized algorithm. But what Furnish Finder does is says, hey, how many times has someone looked for housing in that city for furnished housing? To me, that's a much better gauge than just some algorithm somebody makes up. So check this out. 2,068 times people looked in Mount Vernon, Ohio, this little town of 50,000 people for furnished housing. And so you can use that data and then compare it to another city and say, hey, which one may be better to invest in for uh, furnished housing? And when I compare this against other small cities in Ohio, this one stood out because it has colleges there, has a couple small colleges in Mount Vernon and has its own hospital. Those are two things to look for. And it has really low regulation when it comes to short-term housing. So to me, this gauge is really helpful. All right, the last thing I'll say on Airbnb and short-term rentals is make sure if you do invest in short-term rentals, it will cash flow as a long-term rental. Meaning if they change regulations or if some reason there's a ton of Airbnbs that pop up in the area you purchased in, you can convert yours to a long-term rental and still cash flow. Very, very important. The worst thing would be if you purchased a short-term rental under the assumption that that's the only way you can make money. And if you don't get the rate every day that you need, you can't pay your mortgage on the property. That's crazy. Don't do that. Make sure that if things fall through the bottom and there's massive regulation that comes in the area, you have to you know, change it to a long-term rental. It actually will work. All mine worked that way. I made sure they would work that way before I purchased them. The short-term rental piece was just icing on the cake. It already cash flowed as a long-term rental. Anyway, I hope this information helped you with the short-term rental market. A lot of changes, obviously, because no longer is Austin, Phoenix, and Boise the hotspot. It's now Akron, Ohio, Logan, Ohio, and Fairbanks, Alaska. Who knew? All right, until next time, see you on the next video.